Hello, Fred. Good evening, Alicia. Are we the only ones? Uh, I believe so far. Okay, and who's who's here from the um, community board? I'm sorry, Hi, this is Khalid here. Hi, Khalid. How are you? Doing well. Doing well. Thanks for asking. Hoping you're well. I'm hoping you're well. <laughs> hey, I is am. Thank you. That Myrie is sick. Is that true? Senator Myrie is sick. He he was in the hospital. Yeah, um, I've heard. I think he has COVID. Uh, it, it, at some point he had COVID. Right, I heard he had COVID and he came out. Do you guys know if that's true? You know, because I'm hearing gossip and that's why I'm asking. I prefer not to hear gossip. I prefer to hear. Um, Khalid, did I, you get anything? You got something, Fred? No, I haven't heard anything directly either. But then this he, is the first time I'm hearing of this news, so yes. Oh, okay. But you did hear, Fred, that he was sick and he was hospitalized. I didn't even hear the hospitalized piece. I did hear that he had COVID. Oh. Um, so that was the last thing that I heard. Oh, okay. Any, okay. any, any other, anything else? I have no other information. So he could, right. Okay. I just, I just heard that and I didn't know. I didn't get like, nobody sent anything like, you know, where um, we want to send well wishes. I didn't hear anything. So. Like I said, it was all indirect, so I, I'm not sure. Like I said, I just heard it. I'm not sure. Maybe you just wanted to keep it, you know. You don't want to make a big deal out of it, but that's the last thing I heard. Mm Hi, Maxine. I can't hear you. Hi, Alicia. Uh, Fred. Hello, Chair. Hi, Alicia. Hi, who's that? I can't see you. Monica. Oh, hi, Monica. How are you? Happy I'm New fine. Year. Yeah, Happy New Year to you. It's so nice to hear your voice. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, some people have these very distinct voices, so the moment that you hear it, you know who they are. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Thanks for the invite. Well, you're welcome. You're welcome. We got to stay informed, you know? Yes, yes. It's a big project, and it's going to have a tremendous impact on our community. Yes. I have to give a, I have to give a little contribution soon. Oh, please. We really would appreciate yes. it, because we're definitely trying to do a couple of studies Right. And, but you know, we're doing well, right? We're doing well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I see. I know I, I, I might need to call you all the time, but I, I, I read. Yes. I read everything. Well. We got them to, you know, come back and say yes. that it was going to have negative effects. We got them to say that they're not supporting it, even though they stamped the certification. But that was a major feat for us here in the community. Yes. Because they were going to go right through and say, oh, no negative effects. You know, we need the heights because we need the affordable housing. And all right. the time is going to be okay. But uh, so it was a major feat. It's like the, it seems like it's a good attorney, too. I'm sorry? I said it seems like you have a good attorney. Yes, Alicia Boyd. <laughs> <laughs> Alicia Boyd. <laughs> 
Oh, really? I'm an attorney, but I'm a political activist and an educator. I think you're you know. an attorney, Alicia. No, no, no. Oh. I, but I, but I do. I'm a pro. What that? I'm what you call a pro. pro say. Yeah, pro say. Yeah, litigant. yeah, yeah. I do a lot of the pro say work here too. Yeah, because you know it's expensive to hire an attorney. I know, child. And then you get no justice. So it's like, what's the point? <laughs> And, and then, you know, attorneys don't want to work as hard. I mean, we they work They don't. Hard. They we don't. I hard. mean, it's, you're wasting money most of the times. You know, because it's a you lot. You have to have somebody who actually ha has that kind of heart and they don't have larceny in their mind you know, to, for them to work for you. Exactly. It's terrible. It's terrible. Even the judges. It's, it's terrible. <laughs> Well, we were lucky. We had a good judge, and he was pretty fair, and he was pretty thorough. You know, right. Judge Bodie was a good judge, and he treated us fairly, and we got a good result. So we were blessed. Yeah, that's, that's the point that they have to. Bad, yeah. But some of them don't even read the evidence, and they just deny everything. That's it. Without that's even it. giving you a chance to ask for discovery, they just throw the case out. It, it, it's it's sad. It's really really sad justice this justice system is it's not working hi alejandra how are you doing hey alicia i'm doing well how about yourself good good well. i'm finally getting your name <laughs> <laughs> it took me so long i kept stumbling over it and, ah. <laughs> I'm getting it. I'm getting it. Alejandra. Alejandra. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad I'm getting better at that. I hate to, you know, mess up people's names. I just feel like a name is so important, you know, you know people to say your name right. Thanks. Um, so let's just wait. I know one of our committee members won't be able to be in attendance. Um, uh, they have a conflicting uh, meeting. So I'm just gonna give just a few more minutes to see if uh, anybody else shows up. Cause I believe, I think I'm the only committee member here. Yeah, that's what I was gonna ask. Like who are the members of your team of your committee? Oh no, but what we do know is- This is Matthew, I'm a member. Uh, it's oh. not a good night for video, um, but, uh, but I'm here. Okay, thanks Matthew. You're welcome. Matthew, I know the feeling. Uh, my makeup team took the night off, so you get what you get with me today. <laughs> Matthew Burton, housing committee. How many members do you have on the team anyway, on your committee, Alejandra? I think we only have five total, and I, or including the community members. Because um, we have Migdalia, who's a community member, Inella, Matthew, I'm forgetting. I need to pull up the roster. It's two months since our last meeting, so I'm a little bit uh, rusty here. Yeah, understood. And then you had so much work with the search committee. God, that was a heavy committee. Oh, all the work, all the work, all the meetings, the four hour meetings. Ah, oh, that was a lot of work. Yeah. <laughs> Did they finally find someone? Y yes. They, or hire someone? Yeah, they hired a very young man from Tennessee. You kidding? No, I'm not. Three years worth of working experience. He has a master's from New Jersey. I forget what college. He got a BA from Tennessee. He has about three years of working experience, two level entry positions with the city. Wow. Yeah. So what was the what was the fault with the um, person who was there, the temporary work person? Well, she didn't want she didn't want to move up in the world. She's the oh, assistant okay. PM and we did try to fight for her and she's a great person, Ms. Hilton, but she didn't want the position. Oh. But the, I it, it was felt that if she had, that the, the community board might have supported that position because a lot of the community board members liked her as well. Oh. 
she but she was doing it anyway, so I mean, yeah. I don't understand. Yeah. Well, you know, it's a very political position. So, you know, there's yeah. a lot of political stuff that happens in our community. And some people just don't want to take that on. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll see how well he does. Yeah, but they should hire somebody from New York City, don't you think so? We felt that way. We felt like he should have had at least some experience in Brooklyn, lived here for some time, knew about the community. We didn't feel like he had any of that. I mean, he was in New Jersey for a year and a half, and then he was here for a couple of years in Queens. So we felt that way, but, you know, that's not how the board members obviously felt. Oh, oh well. Exactly. But we have to live with it, right? <laughs> That's right, because you see, I remember who was there before Pearl Myers. Oh, do you? A, okay. A very nice person before Pearl Myers. And then you got Pearl. <laughs> you, what, do you, you, you know the lady we had before Pearl Myers? No. no. Oh, oh she Pearl was a, a wonderful person. Was she? And Pearl, yeah. used, was Pearl used to work for her. Oh, I don't remember now. But what Pearl used name? to work for her, and then they put her, Pearl in the position. I don't remember her name. She was a tall, sophisticated kind of lady. She was really nice. Okay. Um, um, Khalid, are you here today? Hey, Alejandro. Yes, it's me, Khalid. Can I, uh, I just want to just confirm. Uh, are, are you able to get, get the role of, of all the committee members? Uh, for a committee, give me one second to access that for you, and I'll give you the names right now. Give me one second. Hi, Martina. Hi, Constant. I see Constant. Hi, Constant. Hi, Connie. Hi, Connie. Hi. Hi. Are the do committee you, members, you? Are the committee members Alejandra? Alejandra on the website, can we go and um, secure that information? I believe it should be on the website, um, but it won't list our, our community members who usually show up. But it will list the board members on the committee. Yes. Yeah. Right. Hi, Constance. Because I looked for it, I couldn't find it. Hi, Constance. This is Monica. Hey, Monica. Hi. What's up, lady? I love Nami. Yeah, I haven't talked to you in a long time. How are you doing? I know. Good, good. Pretty good. Do all of you know that the Brooklyn Historical Society is merged with the Brooklyn Public Library, seemingly not telling anybody, and the Brooklyn Public Library is going to be the parent association organization? I'm not happy with that. That puts it into politics. Hmm. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and start the meeting. Um, a black library. All right. Um, so I'm just waiting for for Katie to get me the, the full roll to make sure um, I can take an accurate uh, count of all the committee members. Um, I'm Alejandro Caraballo. I'm the chair of the housing committee. Um, so the first item on our agenda today is going to be um, discussion about the associated supermarket on Nostrand, 975 Nostrand Avenue. Um, it's on the corner of Sullivan and Nostrand, just north of Empire. Um, there was a flyering event um, that was co-sponsored by um, MTOP um, this past Saturday. Um, I've been in the supermarket since, and there was in a table in there every day, getting people to sign a petition to keep the associated supermarket open. Um, in addition, from my understanding, uh, State Senator Zona Myria and Assemblywoman Diana Richardson are both working with Impact DC uh, to figure out a solution to be able to keep the supermarket. Um, the supermarket's been there in some form, either as the associated or AMP for years. Um, it's a vital link for chief. Uh, healthy, accessible food for so many in our community, particularly our seniors who um, I see all the time, you know, wheeling their carts 
directly associated. And so this would be a tremendous loss to the community, particularly if it's in the name of just future development of more apartments um, for, for uh, luxury apartments. And so, um, you know, I want to see and uh, discuss this particular issue with the community. Um, if we have quorum with the committee members, we could uh, potentially uh, put a, a resolution um, to send to the full community board um, asking that, you know, our, our political leaders um, uh, do what they can to, to keep it open and that we oppose the closing of the associated supermarket. Um, so if there's anybody who wants to speak on this particular issue, please raise your hand. Um, either through the chat if, uh, or um, as a participant um, or in the chat. Um, since <laughs> Alicia has been taking point on a lot of the activism around here, I will go ahead and hand it off to Alicia. Um, please keep it to about uh, less than three to four minutes. Got it. Um, there is a, a online petition. Um, the, we can't the, hear you well, you're breaking up. That that's because somebody else is not. Yeah, they have noise that people should cut off their televisions or whatever that noise yeah, is. Yeah, they're having background noise. It's not in my house, it's somebody else's. Um, there is an online petition that I'm going to put into the chat. So we're asking people to sign that. It's gotten already over 2000 signatures from there. So that's really very impressive. Um, and also we're going to be um, creating a fundraising platform because we understand that this, the, uh, the associates does not have a lot of legal standing to push back because there are no laws that protect supermarkets once or commercial properties once their lease is up. So more than likely a legal fight is gonna happen. So we are asking people to consider making donations to that once we get it up, um, up and running. We hope to have it up and running possibly by Saturday. And please make sure that you come out on Saturday. Um, there will be speakers, a lot of the potential candidates that are running for office, both in the 40th and the 35th will be there because we do look at this property as a future development site where they will combine the three properties that are already destroyed that are owned by Carl Cohen and then kind of merge the two and really be able to, to build a very large development project. Um, there is the possibility and it could be done where the community can negotiate and, and, and get some concessions. I'm not accepting our local politicians position that is an as of right deal. So there's nothing they can do because we've seen the same thing happen in Park Slopes. Park Slopes had their key food and it was being um, destroyed by an as of right development project and the owners owned the property and the local elected officials were able to work out a deal to keep that key food there. And so if, if your elected officials say, well, well, there's not much I can do, that's because they're not, they don't want to do anything. So it's really important that we be very clear that something can be done. I mean, especially the fact that they're removing a supermarket in the midst of a COVID pandemic. We can definitely file a lawsuit, hire an attorney, file a lawsuit and, and state that this will be devastating to our community if we lose this supermarket. So what we would like for the housing committee to do is to definitely, um, did, I, did I get lost? Okay, definitely. <laughs> what we would like is for the housing committee is to definitely um, put a motion on the floor to state that you know they do not support this development and that we're asking our elected officials to negotiate, step in and negotiate to save the supermarket and do all that they can to do so. Thank you. Thank you, Alicia. So I just checked. Um, it's just me and Matthew. We're missing two other members of the committee, so we don't have quorum. Um, but I'll go ahead and bring it up with the executive committee, uh, uh, the chairs here, um, to see if we can bring a resolution um, to the full community board. Um, let's see, Matthew. You're next. Yes. 
Yeah, Alicia, I was wondering, you mentioned uh, the, uh, the key food in, in Park Slope and how some arrangement was made or some agreement was made. Do you know what, what government entity that was? Was that the city council that did that? And do you know the nature of, of the agreement? Um, no, it was actually the local uh, Park Slopes uh, organization. You know, they have a local organization that, that um, they organize. And so they're the ones who did the negotiation with the support of the elected officials. And the elected officials was their state assembly, their local okay. uh, uh, um, senator, and their city council. So they had all three local elected officials supporting them, but they're the ones who negotiated the deal and the deal was, is that, okay, you're going to develop, but you're bringing back that key food underneath the same conditions. I mean, you're not gonna raise up the rents to make it impossible for them to return. And it was a binding agreement. There was no, so if you sold it to someone else, because a lot of, you know how a lot of developers, they have tons of LLCs. So, you know, mm -hmm. you'll say it's binding to that developer, but the moment that they switch it over, it's no longer binding. So they made sure that the contract itself was binding on whoever wind up controlling the property. And they made sure that the key food came back underneath the same conditions, underneath the same rents. And it was initiated and supported by both the state and the city local representatives. Got it, okay. And you said it was the neighborhood. Is that the, the community oh, yeah. board the over there or slope. like a neighborhood it's called, council? It's called the Park Slope. So, who knows? I met them a couple of times. <laughs> okay. So, so it wasn't a community board, it was... Um, yeah. Self-organized group. Okay, got it. Yes. Yeah, and they're pretty powerful in Park Slopes. They know every month they have meetings and all the politicians show up at their meetings. You know, right. it's a pretty powerful group in Park Slopes. So yeah, it was, you know, it happened. Okay, that's helpful. I, I'm asking because if we want to do something similar to that uh, and, and use that as a model, uh, it's good to know how, how they exactly pulled that off. Thank you. Yeah, but definitely it was done at, with the local elected officials. I mean, they came in negotiating with them as well. Um, Monica, did you want to speak? I see your hand is raised up. Did you say, what did you say? Uh, your hand is raised. Um, oh, no, that was before. <laughs> that was to say hi. <laughs> Okay. Hello, I'd like to speak. Yeah, you can go ahead. Thank you. To um, continue on Alicia's point, aside from the community board publicly stating that they are against the rezoning and the removal of the associated, what other concrete uh, plans and strategies does the committee have? And would the committee consider uh, uh, in letter form, asking the elected to put in writing their support of keeping associated open for the community, especially our seniors, of course. I won't go there because we know, all know how important it is. So to summarize, will the committee reach out? Will they promise to reach out? Will they put, uh, put it to a vote to contact the elected, the council person, the assembly person, the borough president, and their public support of maintaining the supermarket that is essential for the neighborhood, especially our seniors. Yes. Um, so I've already been in contact with Senator Zelnor Myrie's office. I informed their office last week when this first started, uh, when the, the news first broke. Um, as well as assembly member, uh, Diana Richardson. Um, I'm more than happy to continue doing outreach. My understanding is we're working in particular with Impact NYC, which is a nonprofit dedicated to assisting commercial tenants um, be able to stay in their, um, uh, in their leases or, or wherever they're, they're um, based out of. And so, I know that there, there's support at least from uh, those two um, in, in our state delegation, um, particularly, you know, Zonor Myrie's office is like three blocks from the Associated and, and Diana Richardson's office is right across Empire. 
um, you can see it from the associated parking lot. Um, so I know they're very supportive and they're working a lot behind the scenes. Um, and I believe Diana Richardson released a press release specifically about this as well in conjunction with Zelnor Myrie. Um, I haven't done any outreach to the borough president and um, I'm not entirely hopeful about Lori Cumbo actually doing anything. It might be worth just- Despite her coming out in the Brooklyn press saying that she was in support of keeping the associated. She right. Publicly say it. And it was quickly updated and she was removed. Her statement was removed. But okay, sorry to interrupt. <laughs> um, so I can I can also reach out to those two um, uh, uh, just, you know, just to, to make sure we get them on the record of, of where they stand. Um, and so, um, you know, I think in particular, having political support from elected is probably one of the, the key aspects of this um, in order to, to pressure the developers um, or the, the, the landholders to, to be able to keep the supermarket there. Um, and so, you know, I, I wasn't around for the last time this fight was fought in 2014 when they extended their lease another five years. Um, so I, I don't know exactly what was the most effective at that time to, to put pressure, um, but this isn't the first time this has happened and this isn't the first time that community activists and, and, and others have come together to be able to stop the closure of this supermarket. Um, you know, so I'm, I'm optimistic. I, you know, I saw on Saturday, you know, on a below freezing day, like 30, 40 people um, out there, you know, with basically two days notice. Um, and so there's a bigger rally planned for this Saturday at 11 o'clock um, or a protest. Um, and I think it's also important, you know, if, if anyone is in a, a if, if for everyone to, to voice their opposition to the closure of this to their elected themselves as well. Um, it's one thing to have the community uh, or a committee chair um, reach out to the, the elected, but I think the more they hear about it, the more their office is gonna be forceful in the response. Um, and they need to have a lot of pressure put on them. So if you have five, 10 minutes, you know, it's fairly quick. I have spoken with uh, State Senator Zelmer Myrie and, and Assembly Member Diana Richardson's office, um, their, their staff is usually very, they quickly pick up the phone. They're very polite. You know, if you have five minutes, you can just say, look, we really need the supermarket. Um, and that'll be uh, much, uh, that'll be very helpful to do that, to make sure that they, they understand that this is a, a priority for the community. Um, and so, you know, I, beyond that, I don't, you know, I'm gonna, uh, unfortunately we don't have a, a quorum for the committee, but I'm going to recommend um, to the full community board that we, we issue a resolution opposing the closure of the associated and for our elected officials to um, do whatever they can uh, to prevent the closure of the associated. Thank you. Anything anybody else wanted to, to talk about, particularly with regards to the associated supermarket? Well, I, I, I would just like to just give you a little background because you wasn't here in 2014. What happened was that there was a lot of development being brought up in the community during that time when there was an anticipated district-wide rezoning, but that rezoning did not happen. And so that's really what deterred them from evicting the supermarket because the rezoning was promised, it didn't happen. And so they gave them the five-year lease in 2015 when they realized the rezoning didn't happen, but they were being promised that don't worry, it's gonna happen, don't worry, it's gonna happen. So give them a very short lease. So when the rezoning was to happen, they would then turn around and just have a very short lease and then they could develop it. However, Obviously, the district wide rezoning did not happen and because the community did not want it and was very forceful about that. And now, with the MIH program, the mandatory inclusionary housing program in effect that came into effect in 2016, that now gives developers the opportunity to do what we call spot rezonings, such as in this space, and then ask for, you know, skyscraper 
with you know, a couple of affordable housing units that are not affordable to us. So we anticipate that that is their goal, um, merging the properties and then asking for additional heights. Um, and so because the MIH program is in effect, they figure that's the best course because the district-wide rezoning is probably not gonna happen. Okay, so um, on to the next topic. Normally we just kind of do broader issues um, uh, dealing with housing. Um, I do wanna address the kind of like, you know, 9,000 pound elephant in the room. Um, the certification for uh, 960 Franklin was released on Monday. Uh, it was prior to this meeting being scheduled. I mean, it was in, in between and I have not had an opportunity to fully review. I took a look at the certification requirement for this meeting. Um, I mean, the certification documents particularly re relating to the um, affordable housing components. Um, and I believe 20% of the units total were supposed to be at 50%. Um, it falls far short of, of any kind of actual affordable housing for anybody in this community. So, um, you know, what I want to be able to do is uh, schedule a special housing committee meeting that will focus solely specifically on the housing portion of the certification um, so that we can issue our recommendation to the full board, um, at least with what pertains to the housing component and the affordability component. Um, I know that uh, I would want to give the community as much input um, and opportunity to be heard. And since this was just released Monday, um, there was not enough time to, to, to give everybody proper um, uh, notice that we would be discussing it at this meeting and, and taking any kind of formal action or, or uh, recommendation. Um, and so I'm gonna be looking and working with the CB9 office hopefully to schedule something either for, for next week um, uh, and try and schedule something around some of the other committees so that we can have a, a full housing committee. Um, and I know some of the other committees are probably gonna be doing their own review, um, either environmental, obviously Euler, um, uh, you know, potentially, you know, any of the other relevant committees. Um, and so I want to make sure that I, I, uh, I am uh, considerate of, of that so that we are, are able to give the community as much ability to uh, give input um, into the various committees that are reviewing any of the sections of the um, certification. I will say I am a little bit, um, optimistic that we'll be able to, to hopefully um, prevent this development. Uh, most of the political leaders have come out in opposition. However, it's not dead until it's dead. So, you know, I think we need to be able to do our due diligence, review the certification and issue our recommendation. Um, if uh, anybody had any particular uh, comments um, on moving to a special meeting um, next week, uh, to focus solely on this issue. I, uh, Alicia, I see your hand. Yeah, um, I, one of the issues that have come up when we have been in the community, and I think that we're asking the housing committee to consider that now, is the fact that we have so many of our elderly who do not have access to computers. They, are, they don't even have email addresses. And as we were canvassing, and we've been canvassing in our community for the last six years, that has always been a problem that we've had in being able to reach our community residents. Normally they come to hearings because of word of mouth on the streets, so we know a hearing is coming and then they show up. However, in the COVID, I mean, because of COVID, they can't, they won't be able to show up at these meetings. And so I think that one of the first things that we're asking the community board and we're asking the housing committee is to consider the elderly who cannot, who don't have access or, the, or our community residents who are poor, who don't have access to be able to set up a situation where they will be able to have access to the hearing so that they can voice their concern, especially because they will be the most affected because we know gentrification and displacement normally pushes out uh, the, 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 our elderly population. And so I'm asking formally now, what is the position of this committee about 
demanding and ensuring that a large majority of the population will be able to participate at the hearings, including the committee meetings, because you're now having committee meetings where you're asking input from residents and you have no way of first even informing the residents because they don't have access to computers, they don't even have emails. So even when we send out the emails, it's very limited. And now there are dis discussions that they won't be able to engage in. That's a very valid point. Um, you know, I, I think the, the pandemic definitely makes this uh, a unique challenge to make sure that everybody has an opportunity to be heard and participate in the process. Um, beyond Zoom, you know, I don't know what other options there are. Obviously having an in-person event is not safe, particularly for our elderly um, neighbors. Um, and so, or even like a hybrid event. Um, and so, you know, I don't know if you have any suggestions on what's the best way to, to increase participation. Um, we can, you know, um, I'm more than happy to coordinate and work to, to be able to make sure that any questions that, um, you know, if, if somebody doesn't have access to computer or internet, any questions that they may have uh, can be submitted ahead of time and make sure that they're addressed. Um, so that there is at least that kind of participation. Um, if anybody else has any uh, ideas, I'm, I'm more than welcome to, to hear them. Well, and maybe at a minimum, the transcript from the um, meetings could be made public. We never get transcripts, the agendas. Um, I don't know what else, because many of them, again, are not computer savvy and are not even able to attend a committee meeting like tonight. They have visual uh, um, problems and the many are not computer literate, don't even have community, uh, a computer or access to the internet. So again, as off the top of my head, the minutes from the meeting, uh, the agendas uh, sent out, you have a database with all of the uh, senior citizens in the community, I hope, and the senior citizen centers. How about that? I can't hear you, Alondra, you are mute. Yeah, that, um, I mean, transcripts are gonna be nigh impossible to do um, given just the, the length and, and sheer amount of words. Um, you know, I'm an attorney by day and, and I, I deal with transcripts in court and they are very expensive. Um, and so I don't know if, if transcription is, is a possibility, but at least uh, detailed minutes um, and agendas are a possibility. Um, in addition, um, if somebody has, uh, you know, somebody who's unable to attend, um, I'm more than happy if, if somebody wants to submit written comments um, ahead of time, they're more than welcome to do so. And I'll make sure to have that opportunity as well um, so that if they're not able to attend, at least their, their viewpoint is, is expressed. What kind of outreach are you planning? I mean, I, I can, with what we have with the community board through our, our email list, um, I mean, part of it is we're on a, on a timeline to be able to, to review this. I believe it's 60 days, which started Monday. Um, and then, you know, that obviously has to go through the full community board. Um, you know, I was planning to do this this next week. Um, you know, I, I think that that would be adequate time. I, I think, you know, there's been a lot of press. A lot of folks have, have understood that, that this is now pending for the community board. Um, so beyond that, um, you know, I hope uh, community members of this committee and uh, other committee members would be able to also help spread the word. Um, well, thoughts uh, in terms of the transcription. Um, I've I've had that problem too. Uh, it is when you're working in certain domains, especially law, it is cost prohibitive. But there 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 might be another option um, if you're willing to. Uh, we could go a different route. Uh, th there are services out there that are less expensive, and I I'll look into those and and try to determine a, a rough cost estimate. In terms of participation, it's not a complete solution, but it, it is possible to, to participate by audio only, uh, solely by a phone. You don't even need a smartphone. You 
just you know, a, a landline would work because this meeting right here has a phone number and you can listen um, uh, purely with purely with your home telephone. Uh, in terms of providing comments in advance of a meeting, one possibility is to create a voice mailbox and have people per, uh, distribute a phone number that people can call into and and leave their comments there in advance of the meeting. Um, that would probably be that would probably be relatively inexpensive. I'll, I'll have to see what, what the CB9 office is capable of doing um, in that respect. Um, is this a funding? Uh, is that basically a funding question? Yeah, our logistics question. I don't know if they're able to, to just, you know, if somebody has questions, they can just direct them to an, a voicemail box or, you know, just write down what they say. I, I'm, I'm unsure. Um, okay. So, uh, Fred, you had your hand up. Uh, yes, thank you very much. Uh, I, I think these are all points well taken in terms of making sure that we're able to, to do the outreach that is is required and appropriate for, for a matter of this much. I just want to take a moment to disagree with the, the chair. This is not the 9,000 pound gorilla in the room. This is the 15,000 pound gorilla in the room that we've been dealing with for the last couple of years. Uh, and now the moment has come, uh, but I do want to say that I'm very happy with the way uh, the board has already been proactive in terms of some of the outreach some of the information that's been requested. I think the thing that's in our benefit is that this um, proposal has not morphed uh, much more than what we saw a year or two ago when it was uh, appropriate then. We said it was uh, we said it was, a, it was it was DOA back then. It hasn't morphed, so I think a lot of the arguments are already there. Uh, part of what the strategy is going to be is there is going to be coordination with uh, various committees. So absolutely with housing, ULERP, um, parks and Recreation and Cultural Affairs will be involved in this as well. Um, environmental Protection also will probably have an angle at which they should be evaluating this. So this is going to be something that's going to be happening on multiple fronts. Uh, but part of what I, uh, the intent is, I'm going to be working with the chairs of all of those committees in terms of one, getting some kind of coordination done, uh, because obviously with everybody in there, I want to make sure that people are taking appropriate chunks that we're able to schedule appropriately, that we're able to advertise appropriately to make sure that people have an opportunity to weigh in at those points that they, you know, they need to weigh in on. Um, so all the answers won't be had this evening, but this is a question that is going to be coming up. And the idea is to make sure that we're coordinating this um, in, in a manner that we can really take, take care of this and, and address this in a way that we can um, Yeah, so with regards to communications, absolutely. I think. Um, some of the points have been raised already. Listen, people were writing letters for, for hundreds of thousands of years, and we can still have that as, op as an opportunity as well. It's just um, phone options, uh, phone calls do create options of people being able to do it. Um, obviously, if we're going to utilize that, there may need to be some additional training that is put out there. There are options in Zoom in which, yes, you can raise your hand and you can ask questions. More often than not, it's a matter of training in terms of making sure that the um, the explanations on how to use the tools to, to be able to weigh in are, are, are given out as well. Um, but we're going to try and make sure that we're using as many different channels in terms of being able to, to get that information as well. We have 60 days, which is on the one hand, not necessarily a long time, but it is definitely a significant chunk of time for us to, to make sure that we get these things done. I intend to, to make sure that this is not just one opportunity to weigh in. Uh, we are going to use as many different points as we can to make sure that people are able to get their voices heard so we can come as a community and come up with a, a response uh, in which we're going to be able to address this community, uh, address the concerns effectively to all the levels that go past this. So up to the borough president's level, up to the commission, up to the city council, and if need be up to the mayor's office. But what I think is critical is uh, the commitment is on behalf of Community Board 9 is we are going to follow this all the way up. So even beyond our response, we're going to make sure that we are in coordination with the Borough President's Office. We're going to make sure that we are heard at the commission and any other level after that as well. Um, thanks, Fred. Um, oh, I'll get right. I'll be right with you, uh, Alicia. Um, okay, so 
I think the the, the thing that I, I really want to be able to do is, is to coordinate as much with, with the other co uh, committees to make sure we have enough time um, uh, and you know not to conflict with others. So I, I can't give a concrete day that we're going to um, uh, have the next housing committee meeting, but I will assure you all that we will have uh, um, a notice hopefully at least a minimum of a week ahead of time to give uh, enough lead time for everybody to, to know that the, the meeting is coming. Um, and so I'm gonna be coordinating that tomorrow. Yeah, Fred? Yeah, I just had one last additional point of information. Uh, so with regards to the clock, the clock for CB9 actually did, didn't start on Monday. Typically, uh, this goes back to when it was coming into snail mail, they would announce the certification, but the clock did not start for seven to 10 days after. So from the conversations I've heard, I think the calculations are our clock would expire somewhere around April 12th. We will confirm that information. Um, but otherwise, you know, you know, we're, we're working, going to be working very aggressively in terms of making sure that we're doing as much outreach and, and getting the information out as we can. Thank you. Thank you. Alicia, you had a, a comment? Yeah, um, one of the things that I think that we need to be very conscious of is that the, the plan has changed since the last, since the, the bulk of the information that was given to us. They actually said the 20% the 20 had changed to a middle class setting. They didn't give any details of what that middle class was, whereas the 50% was supposed to be more of the low to moderate income. And so one of the requirements is to have updated, the updated, um, so it's important that certain types of documents have to be made available to the public in order for us to make an assessment. So you cannot be working on old documents. You have to be working on the up to new documents. We do not have a declaration page that covers the exact uh, parameters of this development project. That's missing. We do not have a detailed description of how many apartments, the sizes of those apartments, and the target population for those apartments. All developers are supposed to do that, especially underneath the MIH program. And this additional 20%, we don't have that. So it's in, in, important that this committee, <laughs> the board, demand these documents, because how can we assess something if we don't have the information? So they did change the parameters. They went up to uh, middle, the middle class, they're now saying it's a middle class, the 20% is now a middle class. We want to know what middle class means, what target populations, and very specifically, the sizes of those apartments, how many of the apartments, how many are studios, how many are one bedrooms, and what is the population for those things. Without that information, we're just spinning our wheels. So, um, and the declaration page. So, can we please ask for those itemized um, documents to ensure that you're asking for the right thing and then getting the right thing? Secondly, um, I, I mean, I do appreciate Matthew's um, suggestion that people phone in, but there's no way of talking when you phone in. A lot of our people have what we call Obama phones, and these are very, very simple phones. They don't allow you to interact with anyone during a, a Zoom conference. You lose that. Also, um, one of the things is people come to these hearings not just to, to participate, but also to learn. It's really important. They come to hear what other people are saying. They come to see the presentations. You know, they, they want to talk to their neighbors. This is being lost on our population. Our population does not do a lot of reading. So I personally don't think, not, even though I know uh, Maxine had asked for the transcripts, I don't know how many people will read those transcripts. Um, so being able to be present is really important. Um, the courts are starting to demand that these types of hearings, because it is a mandated requirement to have public hearings and participation at those hearings the court is demanding that alternative spots are considered. So my suggestion is not for the community board to take on this role of trying to do this, but the Department of City Planning, that you ask the Department of City Planning. The Department of City Planning is the one who's pushing this development. There is their responsibility, you know, to 
to adhere to the city charter rules of mandated participation. So instead of the community board trying to figure out how to get this done, there should be a conversation with DCP and say, hey, we have a large population. They're unable to participate in this, these hearings. How are you gonna make that happen? Uh, Suki, do you have a, a point or a question? Yeah, I have a question. I keep hearing it mentioned that the AFL-CIO Housing Trust is funding the affordable apartments for this building. Does anyone know anything about that? Yes, yes, I know about that. They, they, are, they are trying to create a bond. It's an investment bond. It's not the funding. They're investing in this property. So it's an investment bond that they are they are now engaging in. So they are going to be asking for a bond to help pay for the development project itself as an investment. So they want to make money out of the bond. So it's not a gift. <laughs> so they're lending, they're lending money to build this project. Yes, they're lending money with the understanding that they're going to get a return on their money because it's an investment bond. Let's be clear about that. So it's basically going to be a market rate mortgage. Well, if the affordable housing is geared towards the middle class, the MIH target is the working option, which is for people who make between 100 and $140,000. That's middle class. And then if the 20% is middle class, and I don't know what the 20% middle class means, that's why I'm asking for clarification, but that would mean the entire 50% is for who make over a hundred thousand dollars? Are they already committed, or is this just an agreement at this stage? We have not received the the previous documents, and that's why we're asking for more updated okay. documents. But the previous okay. documents do not have a commitment, but they were seeking it. Okay. All right. Thank you. Based off, so I read the housing portion uh, earlier today. Um, from my understanding, fifty percent are supposed to be what they call like for middle class. 20% um, are supposed to be at 50% um, AMI, which for a family of three, I believe is around $52,000. Um, let me see what the, and we can, this will be covered in detail at the full meeting, um, but. Uh, and what was the 50 class? What was that 50, what is the middle class? What is that talk? Over, yeah, that's what I'm going to uh, co cover just based off of what my reading was of it. So yeah, 50% uh, AMI for a family of three is 51,200. Um, and then the rest of it was supposed to be a, an additional 10% was supposed to be at around 80% AMI, um, which would be 81,000 for a family of three or closer to 82,000. And those are the only commitments that are required as part of the mandatory inclusionary housing, from my understanding of reading the documents. The additional 20% that's supposed to be called affordable is voluntary and it's supposed to be aimed at what they call middle income, but it's at 100% and 120% of AMI, which for comparison, 110, um, I mean, 100% of AMI for a family of, hold on one second. Um, for a family of three is 102,000 a year. And then for 120%, it's 122,000. So basically 20% that they are including as part of affordable are for people who are making six figures for a family of three, um, which is, is far above and beyond what, you know, the typical residents in this community make. So, you know, I, I'm very skeptical. Um, you know, of the, the, the numbers that were reported in the certification document that I saw. Um, we'll be able to get into more detail in those in, in a full hearing. Um, and I will actually be, uh, hopefully be able to actually prepare um, and go into depth and get a, a better understanding of what is committed. There's additional, um, uh, uh, there's different options that they have. So there's not even like a, de a defined one. There's two different versions that they're analyzing in, in the document. So you know, all this can be covered. Uh, Fred, did you have something to say? Yeah, just very quickly. I mean, I think that all these are, are, are great questions and all valid questions. Uh, but part of what I think is going to be very helpful, especially prior to the conversations I have with the chairs of the committees, is that any of these questions or things that action items that need to get done in terms of getting information or information gathering or open questions, please
please make sure you get those to the chairs. So please send that to the, the committee chairs so that they have that. So that way, as we're considering how we're going to move forward, we can appropriately budget time and resources in terms of making sure committees are able to address these things. So I would so I would then ask that a detailed summary of the apartments, the apartment sizes, how many apartments, you know, the target populations for those apartments are given. Can you ask for that, Alejandra? Yeah, I can work with the CB9 office to see if we can get copies of that from DCP. And also the, um, the, the declaration page. That's the page that controls the large scale industrial manufacturing development project. It's a very important document. It, you know, it, it, it's, it's the rules and laws that they have to abide by. It's, it's a very controlled document. We need to see that. We've asked for it several times. We've gotten nothing but the blank pages we need the filled out one because now that the application is certified, that document has to be there. And I looked through and combed through and I did not find it. Did you find it, Alejandra? Did you find no. that declaration page? No. Okay. I, 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 so that's the other item that we're asking for is that declaration page. Okay. okay. Um, so um, at this point, um, I think we're ready to, to move on from this. Um, I'm going to work with the other committees and, and the chair to, to coordinate um, our meeting time. I will make sure that we have enough lead time at our next meeting uh, to specifically go over um, this and, and it will be the only item agenda for that day. Um, and it'll be a hearing specifically on this issue. Um, and so um, beyond that, uh, you know, typically what I, I do at the, the housing committee meetings, if there's any other pressing or um, housing issues that um, are occurring in the community. This is kind of the time if you wanna speak about them or um, bring them up. Um, otherwise that, that's the last item on our agenda for today. Well, I- Alejandro, oh, go ahead, sorry. Alicia. I also when asking, are you going to be asking for them to do a racial impacts analysis because I our community is the second most affordable community in Brooklyn and a massive development project that's gonna have all this luxury development. And we've been hearing from everyone the need for racial impact when it comes to rezonings. Will that be something that we can ask the city, the Department of City Planning to do so that we understand what's gonna to happen to our population if this development goes through? I, I can look into that. Thank you. Matthew? Yes, is it possible, Alejandro, to provide us with a link to this to the certification document, or at least uh, tell us where you found it? We can't hear you. Sorry, I will put it in the chat now. Great, thank you. I had one other item on a different topic. If we're ready to move on. Okay, yes, I, I'm just gonna put the, the certification in the chat um, and then you can go ahead. Got it, thank you. Uh, during our, la our last meeting, we discussed the lien sale and we decided to uh, independently contact the uh, people in our community who were on the lien sale list. Does, th does anyone know if that has occurred yet? It has not. Um, McDalia sent me a draft of the, the letter. I, you know, I apologize with, with running this committee and um, the district manager search committee and, and just a lot of things going on. Um, Having a life, yeah. Yeah, I haven't been able to be on, as on top of it. Um, but I think the, the, the main obstacle was, um, you know, McDalia drafted the letter um, and we identified, I think, uh, the community board members and their, their address. We had the, the document last time. I think the, the biggest thing was just getting a budget item to pay for the postage and um, uh, uh, the stationery and everything to send out the letter um, and to get okay from the chair and the exec committee. So um, that's the, I, what I can do is I can um, 
bring up, bring it up at the next exec committee um, and request it as an action item. Um, I mean, I, I believe it was about 60 that we identified that live in uh, CB9 that are on the lien sale list. Uh, you know, printing out 60 letters and mailing them out shouldn't cost more than, you know, probably $50 total. Um, so I can't imagine it's a, a huge burden, um, but uh, would need to, to make sure that we get approval from the exec committee before we send that out. Okay, thank you. Is there anything anybody else wanted to, to bring up? I just want to ask, um, when do you anticipate having this special meeting? Just so I could just think of, I know that you need to coordinate with all the other chairs and make sure you're not doing it in between, but do you have a rough idea when you might be meeting again? Yeah, I thought it would be, initially I thought it would be better to have it as soon as possible, but I think giving more time for, for coordination um, uh, and uh, to also get the word out that we'll be having this is, is probably more important. So I would imagine probably two or three weeks. I don't know, what, but I can't give any firm definitive deadline until I speak with all the other chairs and we, we coordinate um, a schedule so that everybody gets an opportunity to be heard at, at all the different committees. Um, and also what, you know, the, the, the schedule will be for the full community board. Cause if we have, you know, the 60 day clock hasn't even started, you know, we'll be able to get through the February and March full community board meetings without uh, passing the, the, the clock. So that gives us enough time. Um, and so we, you know, I think it's better that we, we do this prepared rather than rushed. Um, and so, um, I, uh, what I will say and what I will commit to is is giving at a minimum a week's notice that we will be having. Thank you. Thank the, it, it, that's appreciated because if you do the, the normal three days, it really doesn't give us enough time to organize and be able to get people to come out. So a week would be nice. We would appreciate it, Ms. Alejandra. Yeah, and I and I also be just you know so that we're able to actually pass a recommendation on. I need to have a quorum from our, our um, housing committee members. Okay, um, so I think that that wraps up our agenda. I want to thank everyone for showing up um, and, and coming out tonight uh, to the meeting. Um, again, uh, on the uh, on the issue of the, the associated, please contact your your um, state senator, state representative, or assembly member, and, and city council member, and the borough president. Um, uh, there's a rally this Saturday or a protest this Saturday at 11 a.m. at the Associated. Um, sign, uh, you know, the petitions, um, you know, anything you can. I think this is a very important thing. Uh, I will be in touch with everyone about uh, the 960 Franklin uh, hearing for the, for the housing committee. Um, and without, you know, any other objection, um, and sir, uh, I think there's only one other community board member on here. Um, Matthew, if you would uh, move to uh, adjourn the meeting. So moves. Second. <laughs> All right, have a good evening, everyone. Good too. Thank you, Alejandra. Thank you. Good meeting. Thank you.